Good afternoon, everybody. Just waiting for the slides to come up. But as we wait for the slides, can you have a big round of applause for both of us? <laughs> louder, louder, louder if you can. Right? Because, because there are no <laughs> aha moments in these slides. Right? And more often than not, uh, we don't get these after we finish. So hopefully, we'll make up for it in panache for the lack of content. Fantastic. Raj, what do you think? I think uh, you put a leopard in my backyard, but uh, that's a CNN trying to figure out what kind of a cat that is. What do you think? I think this is beautiful. I also think you would agree so, right? Uh, if you understand what it took Mithun H to get this out. It took him 12 months, concentrated effort, to get this beautiful shot out of Kabini in Karnataka, right? And I read through, you know, what does it take to be a wildlife photographer? Uh, the first one Mithun says is, you've got to embrace the jungle. You've got to be part of the ecosystem. You cannot be different than, you know, other animals, right? So much so that uh, when Mithun walks into his camp, the langus, you know, don't see him different. The second one, which is super important, is uh, your objective should be greater than your fear. More often than not, the 12 months, the only thing which carried Mithun was uh, the larger purpose, not all the fears of what would happen if I don't get a great shot. The third thing he says is there is no right time. There's only right frame. What he means by this is the journey is long, and uh, you have to keep doing what you have to do. You've got to go through the grind. And at magical moment, you would hit what you destined to hit. The fourth one, which is super important, is dodging distractions. Right? Uh, the jungle is a beautiful place. You would see an amazing set of you know, wild animals that you would really, really want to capture, but that is not what you're there for. Right? You're there for capturing uh, the black panther and the leopard. So you've got to hold on to your distractions, focus on what you would like to deliver out of it. The fifth one, be patient. It's a long journey. You've got to go through the grind, be patient, and you will get a great shot. So is this the theme for the day? Are we no, going to talk no, about no, this? no. Sorry, this was You're just going to a... talk about panthers and... This stuff. was just a distraction. They paid money for this event. Okay. Give them something they want. <laughs> right. <laughs> very crowded slide, very consulting. This is our ploy, our magic ploy for consultants. You know, really small fonts, lots of information, lots of crowding on one slide. Yes, absolutely true. It's quite crowded, right? It's quite crowded with the fact that there are venture capitalists crowding to put money on AI companies, right? It is crowded with people believing that AI could solve a lot of problems, right? It is crowded with parent organization trying to figure out how do I set my GCC in India. It is also crowded with respect to uh, the talent which is coming up, you know, especially in this part of the world. But what is not quite crowded here is the percentage of companies which actually find a mechanism to deliver value out of all these investments. Right? While this is a fact, the reality is quite different. We see 89% of people sitting in the board believe that they've got digital completely embedded within their platforms. While honesty, only 28% of digital and analytics leaders believe that they got data and analytics, digital, completely part of their business strategy. Out of it, 20% of the companies believe that they got less than 10 percentage, you know, back, booked back into uh, their books, either from a productivity gains or from revenue transformation. But over 67% of the companies believe that they're still to get reasonably good return on investment. So there is a big gap in value creation. Right? And this gap is not just for value creation. So this is from a survey that we did along with the university. And I want you to focus on the left, OK? And on the uh, top, see, this is a survey that was measuring the willingness to trust and accept AI, right? On the left, you've got the BICS countries. There's no R in that. I don't know what for. Maybe you know the war. But BICS average score is 60. That's the trust they have. And on the right, you'll see United States, Germany, Europe, the UK, and others. And you'll see their willingness is 30.4. That's a big gap. You would imagine that a westernized, 
highly mechanized, highly automated society might have more faith in AI. But this is counterintuitive. But you know what? I'm pretty sure there's a pretty darn good reason for why those numbers are reflecting there. Because with maturity also comes a lot more circumspection, right? What Abs do you think? Abs absolutely true, right? There's one side on the reasons, right? Yeah. I'm sure we will put in enough guardrails, enough control on the AI system for this gap to reduce. But what is also happening is we're also becoming super live in the box kind of you know, technology society. We got everything out of the box. All we do is configure and quickly deploy it. Thereby, your ability to build in trust is not going to come in from the technical aspects. It is going to stretch beyond the technologies, and technology itself has a lot of problems. Right? If you look at you know, uh, the visible part above the uh, line, you see you know, on the top there are symptoms around unrealized AI value. You see symptoms around disparate data sources, uh, massive number of external internal data sources, still figuring out how do I go through the grind and get the data in. Right? But underneath, if you look at, we've got problems around cross-functional people working together, both from tech, business, and data. We've got at least eight to nine months for one single machine learning model to go into production and start a monetization cycle. And the time it takes for you to make data available to time it takes for you to make it available for monetization, that keeps stretching. Right? I think one of the single biggest causes, and I think most of us know it, uh, Akhilesh touched on it in the morning. I've heard a few other people talk about it. I think you've got to think of this like, you know, the Titanic sank because you never knew how deep that iceberg was. Right? You could only see at the top, the captain said, everything's okay. This ship will never sink. But the point is, if your base data is not organized, if it's not engineered, right, to perform all of these miraculous so-called use cases sitting at the top, you're not going to have much of a strategy. You're also sitting on a Titanic. So the idea is, and we've seen this from our experience, that a majority of the problem lies at the bottom of the iceberg. But everybody wants to focus on that at the top, right? Because it's sexier. It's something you can see, you can consume. But that's not the reality of it. What do you think, Kamish? Right, absolutely, right? We looked at problems, you know, gaps with respect to realization. We looked yeah. at gaps with respect to willingness to trust. And there is obviously tech gap. Yeah. But do you think there is a quick solution? Because they've come here for a solution, not for articulation of problems. So there is no vaccine or cure for this. And there is no magic bullet. There is no panacea for this, unfortunately. But what we've seen is there are certain frameworks. There are certain levers right, that you can use to accelerate your AI COE, right? And this is where the Jugalbandi of business and tech comes in, right? Jugalbandi or yin and yang? Yeah, easier said than done, right? Because we're figuring out how to do this uh, Jugalbandi and we're struggling, right? And hopefully, you know, it is as tough for business and tech to actually come together and uh, get into a transformation role, right? While both these frameworks work, mm -hmm. they give you enough escape velocity to you know, pass through your initial inertia. But what it does not do when it uh, runs standalone is help you scale up your efforts to create a purely self-sustained COE. I can almost imagine this working very differently, right? And this is your classical tech versus business problem. Uh, Shashwat touched on it before, that you know, we want to be together, not separate, right? And I think this is especially important from a GCC perspective, because if you, you, you don't call it a GCC, and I love the way you said it as well, don't call it a GCC, right? Call it a capability center, because everybody's got to come together to solve this problem. And the way to think about this is, how do you make your data available as a product, right? Think of your data as a product. You could be solving a supply chain problem, you could be solving a, a, a customer experience problem. In fact, we have a booth outside where a lot of people come and put these magnets on the board, and I saw that customer experience was 24% of the folks. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to change that, right, you've got to think very, very differently. You've got to think about how do I solve a problem by providing this data like a product. Like, you know, just like you pick up a product from a shelf, right? You pick the product, you consume it. So I think that's what we have to move towards, right? right. Rightly so, right. More so because... Uh, 
this aspect of the tech-led framework and the business-led framework is not going to be easy for you to implement. So what we have done is, you know, out of all the experience that we've got, we put in top four hacks that we have seen work in the trenches that has helped some of our customers, you know, uh, go through this phase of uh, finding out how do I become more effective, more value-adding, and thereby creating a self-sustained <coughs> mechanism to serve the parent company. But it looks like the first lever is build the courage of Matador. That looks impressive, uh, Raj, but what is that about? Um, I like Spain. I like bullfights. Uh, by the way, do you know how we generated this image? Any guesses? AI? AI? Yeah. Right? Uh, all the images that we've generated is using AI. Right? Um, I think it's an apt analogy. Uh, you know, matadors are standing in the middle of a bullfight. I don't know whether you guys have seen a bullfight, but it all boils down to how you can stare someone else down, including a bull, and maneuver, of course. That's the same thing with data, right? How do you maneuver yourself around the data? And to do that, you need somebody who's got a bit of a few things going on for him or her, right? First of all, at least I believe, and we believe, because we've seen this on the ground in the trenches, you need some tenure in that organization, right? So a leader has to be someone who spent some time in that organization, maybe eight years, 10 years or more. We've seen folks who spent nearly 18 to 20 years, right, in the organization. You need somebody who can hustle. Because believe me, guys, we don't like to say this, but every time you're selling, you're selling all the time. Whether you're selling to your boss, whether you're selling to the board, the point is to do that, you need someone with some panache. Hopefully we're doing that because we don't have content. But that said, apart from that, we also feel that you need a person who understands the stakeholders and the ecosystem, right? Because there's always that one guy in some function in your organization who's trigger happy and who sees the value of analytics because he is going to cut your check. And you're going to need a lot of checks. Right? So don't think of this as a one-time kind of a budgeting exercise. So you need someone like that. And what we think, based on what we've seen, the person doesn't necessarily have to be an analytics guy or an AI guy. The person can be someone who appreciates it, right? But can then build a team around them to sustain it, right? Which brings me to the second level. Doesn't look like Marlon Brando, by the way, but uh, hey, I could forgive the AI sometimes. But uh, this is the second level, right? You need a very strong sponsor. Think of your sponsor like a harness, right? You know, Rocky Balboa, you, you've heard the line, right? In it, how hard you get hit, it depends on if you can get, gap, get back up. Sorry for the bad impersonation, but point being, you're going to get hit a lot of times. Which brings us to the, next, to the next level, right? Kamesh, and you're picking a game. Again, you're getting into games and Panthers and stuff for this audience. Pick, 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 pick the right game. Uh, Raj, in my opinion, is your ability to pick the right choice of use case, right? For me, this would possibly be the most important lever for success. Out of, you know, a lot of use cases which could give you incremental operational outperformance. Your ability to go through not living by the quarter, but living by an enterprise-wide outlook on how do you want to transform is very important. And this is exactly what one of my customers did, right? Uh, it's a large automotive uh, client uh, set up their uh, uh, COE with regional operating companies, all trying to figure out who would own the AI, who would own the government, uh, sorry, the, who would own the uh, data, uh, who would govern it. Uh, but the choice of use cases out of all the 100 use cases was uh, around customer analytics. And given the context of the industry, right, uh, they're moving from product-centric to customer-centric uh, full model change, uh, business model, I would say. So it is important for them to look at customer more differently. And this was a perfect choice for them, so much so that the regional operating company started ensuring that there's a fair bit of success behind this. Right? So choice of use case is super important. Uh, I would also you know, come to the last level that we're speaking about, zero degree separation. This is about how closely are you aligned with uh, business. Right? Um, today, what we see is between successful uh, COEs, they're starting to lose uh, a lot of you know, tech jargons out 
don't worry about uh, uh, XG boost, don't worry about gradient uh, boost, but start looking at business language as a part of your communication. And that is why right, the large French uh, uh, company of ours, uh, uh, client of ours, started looking at transforming their language from being called as a tech-centric COE into transformation office. That enabled them, given them the opportunity to move away from work takers within the COE to being able to deliver transformational change with, for the organization. So it is important to stay super close with your business. Don't have difference between data, device, uh, domain, business. Put all of them together in a box and see how it will work for you. Right? So with that, what we said was uh, there is absolutely no magic bullet. Hmm. What, what we've seen is seven out of 10 companies have a reasonable success when you use these levers. The easiest way for you is to go closer to where experience remain and uh, shorten the wavelength, scatter yourself to do a great job, and uh, you're there to conquer the blue sky. That's the Doppler effect, right? Elementary physics. But thank you so much. Thank for you so much, everyone. Day.